Um, by way of background, over the, the last three days, we've had a number of meetings that were reviewing um, infrastructure, PPPs, as well as service provision PPPs in, in education. And a lot of the topics we discussed on days one and two were repeated this morning in, in terms of the infrastructure. This morning I was asked to present a uh, overview or a case study on a PPP and I had prepared my materials, but on Monday, when um, the Secretary of Education, Brother Armin Luistro, spoke, he posed a challenge to the group. He said, you have a large number of overseas Filipino workers who are scattered around the world, and many of them are in countries where their children do not qualify for the education system, to be a part of the local education system. As a result, these children are disenfranchised. They're without educational opportunities. Their parents are working very hard and they're unable to, um, unable to put the kids into private schools because of the low incomes that they make. So his challenge was, how could you create a PPP that would address this issue. Yesterday, as I was coming back up uh, on a very well delayed, okay, let's see. Whenever I speak, we have, we, we have technical issues. There we go, Seth. There we go. So yesterday, as I was coming back to Manila, I started brainstorming to myself, if I wanted to create an educational PPP that were addressing this issue of educating the children of overseas Filipino workers, how would I put this together? And I decided, let's apply the same technique to building a PPP that we use with our clients, both on the public sector and on the private sector. So my case study today is a hypothetical case study. This is a case study of how we would build a, an education PPP. Now, when we're looking at PPPs, most of you are already familiar with the PPP regulatory regime in, in Philippines. You understand the BOT law. You understand the steps to processing a PPP or developing it where you scope a project. You, it's called screening. You move into pre-feasibility stage, feasibility stage, and then you tender the PPP. What I'd like to do is show you a little bit about the nuts and bolts behind it in a very, very quick and shallow way, but the way that we think as transaction advisors or PPP structuring advisors. We always start with a problem definition, and here the problem definition is that there are between 11 and 13 and a half million overseas Filipino workers spread around the world. In, many of the, in some of the countries, these families are unable to educate their children and the children are excluded from the educational process of the host country. So how could the Department of Education address this? Well, a project concept is, is, is your next step. And in the project concept, uh, we would say that you would invite the private sector to cooperate with the government to design, build, finance, operate, and maintain an online Philippines education portal to reach families of these overseas foreign workers. Now, what does that mean? Um, how are you going to finance this, this idea? Well, if I were in the Department of Education, the first step I would take would be to do a project scoping, but do it with the assistance of someone like ADB, um, one of your development partners, and hire a team of specialist advisors who help scope and, and determine, is there a project, is there a PPP available here? So in our hypothetical, the Department of Education engages with its development partners and 
it, it seeks technical assistance to bring on board a team. And the team of advisors is first under this um, technical advisory grant are, are hired to help scope and refine the project. The kind of advisors that you would want on board would be an education specialist, your PPP structuring specialist, legal, an IT and financial specialist. The team makeup can be very flexible. Typically you have a technical advisor, legal advisor, and financial advisor. Here you're going to need additional advisors because of the uniqueness of, of the proposition. Once, oops, once your team is brought on board, the, the team begins examining the whole scope of the problem and begins brainstorming on how they can refine this and convert this into a project PPP. Now by project PPP, I specifically mean a PPP that is able to drive itself from its own revenue source. And so this hypothetical team has, has made some early conclusions. First, they realize that the IT solutions already exist, that there are a number of education portals out there, there are cloud-based platforms, so you do not need to go out and build a massive data center to drive this thing. Um, therefore, they are um, able to, to make use of existing, existing processes, existing assets of other people. In addition, that um, because these children are typically children of people from localized provinces who have their own language, running the program in English or Tagalog may not be enough. You may need to localize into the other languages of the Philippines. If you need to localize into the other languages, how do you go about doing that? Well, the team, the hypothetical team, decided you should engage with NGOs who are already dealing with education and family issues around the provinces to tap into their interest to help convert content that's national level content into a localized version. And this may already exist that may already be implemented at the local level, but your, your NGO team would then be able to take that information and bring it back to the service provider, to your, your PPP provider, to localize it. The team would then go out and start canvassing the interest of the private sector. And the private sector has CSR programs, so there's a natural interest to want to support the betterment of the Philippines. But some of the CSR programs are not enough to drive a PPP. So the, the private sector wants to know, how can this thing pay for itself? And the easiest solution would be to try to make it an availability payment basis from the government. But that means that we've got to deal with government budget allocations and makes the project a little bit less interesting from a pub public sector perspective. So the team is then tasked figure out a way to make this thing self-sustaining and pay for itself. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. So the other problem, there's a technical issue there. These overseas foreign workers are at a fairly low economic status they don't have computers. They don't have internet. <laughs> well, that kind of shuts the program down right there. So the team scratches, scratches its heads and says, wait a minute. There has to be a way to get computers into the hands of, of the target um, clients. And so the, the team looks around and they say, oh, yeah, of course. You've had this program that was announced all the way back in 2006 to develop rugged, inexpensive computers that can be handed out to children all over the world, a $100 laptop idea. Well, there it is. You have your $100 laptop. It is a portal. How can we get this implemented? So there's the current version of it. 
It's very nice. It's a hundred dollar tablet. It's rugged. It has built-in Wi-Fi. So there's a bit of a technical solution found already. Now, this private sector player sitting in Manila who's partnering with other private sector players in big cities around the world are going to have a very difficult time getting these computers into the hands of your target clients. Therefore, I go back to the need to tie up with something like an NGO. An NGO is on the ground in the Philippines. NGOs are on the ground in local areas. And working with NGOs, the, the team determines that there's a pathway to get these low-cost computers into the hands uh, of the children. But there are still technical and possibly political hurdles. So the team dis discovers that they need some form of registration system. Handing out a computer that can then be immediately sold is, is a bit of a risk. That's a risk that needs to be mitigated. So the team starts to look at outside of the box ways to create a registration system and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. They need a low cost solution for data transmission. So part of the strategy of a team designing a PPP like this would be to find a connection <clears throat> to the uh, telecoms of the target areas and have the telecoms agree to be providing the service to create in the easiest way possible the data transmission services to connect to these tablets. Okay, that can be way through a variety, the legal agreements to that are not that difficult. It's the pathway to get to them. So to get to that pathway, there may need to be government support. And some of the government support would need to be on a bilateral basis. So this is something that the private sector can, can start to build out this PPP structure. But the government can contribute in ways that are non-monetary. And one way is to work on a bilateral relationship with the target areas to say, look, this is an issue that affects both of our countries. We have a displaced population who needs to be educated. You have a population of our workers who need support, but you're unable on your own budget to provide the support. Therefore, government A, please intervene, help us connect the dots within your jurisdiction, make this a social cause that, that even your own people want to stand behind and your own telecoms want to stand behind to ensure that your, the, the framework starts to come together. Now, the other forms of government support might need to be financial at some stages of a project. So we already talked about availability payments. The easiest way is to say, as a private sector, I'll develop this for you, but you pay me on a regular basis per the number of students we're reaching, okay? Um, or give me a vou have a voucher system in place. Again, as I said, this may not be the most attractive approach from a government perspective because it's another bu budget allocation and, and a hassle. Um, but it is something that needs to be considered. You can provide capex subsidies. So initial subsidies to help build out the, the infrastructure for this. So purchasing the tablets on a bulk basis helping set up a data center to manage this, helping get the costs of the cloud-based system managed. Those are capex that um, can, can be done and can be supported by government, or they can be done by the private sector. And we still want the private sector to try to cover as much of that as possible. Now, let me give you some real economics on this. How much would this data center cost? We did an e-government procurement project in Vietnam. And we, we made a really interesting um, discovery. The FS advisors produced a massive report 
that pointed to one kind of technology sold only in one country in the world. And we were asked as independent reviewers to come in and take a look at this FS report and figure out how we could get better value for money out of it. Well, when we took a look, it was completely input specific. You had to buy this kind of mainframe. You had to buy you know, th these kind of cables. And they were only sold by one company. And we decided to do some due diligence on the, um, uh, on the uh, advisors and found out that those advisors were actually part of a, um, uh, a business group that was paid for by the, the suppliers. Okay, so we then went out to market and we said, look, this system, you're quoting us $18 million for year one to install. Certainly it can't cost that much. We talked to New Zealand and found out that they had an even bigger, more robust program for under $4 million. So this is what can be done. You can go out to market, you can look, you can find uh, other examples and use off-the-shelf technology to the extent possible to, to reduce the cost. Okay, so the team comes up with some solutions and they say, okay, if government is unable to subsidize this thing, and we need to uh, invite the private sector to pay for it themselves. How can we do that? Well, one way is to permit the private sector to increase its range of, of offerings to the targets. So you're not just providing a single education portal. Here are some of the things that you could do. You can do your distance learning portal. But you could also include adult distance learning for the members of the family. So offer additional um, programs. And you want to do this through some kind of user fee basis. But how do you get user fees paid by individuals in the middle of the jungle of Saba? How, how do you do that? Well, interestingly, all of these families every month are wiring their salary back to, parts of their salary back to the Philippines. There it is right there. There's already an established system by which money is trading hands from the workers and making its way back to Philippines. So what the team does is they go out and they say, let's expand the scope of our, share, uh, our stakeholders, our private sector stakeholders, to include the money transfer companies like Western Union. And we do a deal contractually with Western Union that Western Union handles the fees for the program, very de minimis fees. And on an aggregated basis, those fees start to add up. And also by doing this, you start to legitimize some of the money flow back into the country because if you work a deal with someone like Western Union and you make an agreement on what fees they can charge, that is I think ultimately going to help the, the overseas foreign worker because the fee rates will start to become more, more stabilized. I, I've seen a number of um, people outside of Philippines trying to wire, wire money back, and they can lose more than 10%, sometimes 20% of their, their earnings through these wire fees. So the private sector should be engaging with this, this way of bringing the money in. Um, there are also a lot of microfinance groups out there who want to get involved. So it's thinking totally outside the box. Now, our PPP is starting to get very, very complex for a simple $5 million PPP. Um, but the other offerings, there can be online academies that are not directed only off, offshore, but are redirected onshore. So the program can be expanded to deal not only with children in Sabah, but also to be addressing children in, in the far reaches of Mindanao or you know, other, other areas. The program can have a certain limit of advertising permitted. Advertising is very valuable and it can pay for uh, online activities. And then 
there may also be offerings of some kind of reintegration services. So social services that would occur here who need access and need to know who's coming back to Philippines would have an interest to participate in this. And you might find financial channels, money channels through there. The private sector could also engage with the CSR um, units of the various corporations around Philippines. And as I said earlier this morning about your um, other interesting stakeholders, the church. In the Philippines, the church is very active. It has money. It may have an interest in, in participating in this. Okay. So, who are going to be the private sector stakeholders in, in a deal like this? You, you would have a leading private education provider. You, you need a 60-40 split at least, 60% Filipino owned. So you need Filipino education providers, but you also need the provider of IT solutions. You need a financial services provider and money changing provider as we mentioned, and then also engaging NGOs. Now, it is possible to create a consortium that actually involves NGOs as a shareholder. I don't see a reason that can't be structured. Now the NGOs would be a shareholder to get benefits, but they would, you would probably want them on a private sector side to operate as more silent shareholders. They don't really vote uh, to manage the, the project, but they have a participatory right. <clears throat> so here's what we've done. We've found that the private sector pulls together the data management and curriculum dissemination services. They find a low-tech technology to back this thing up. They expand the service by connecting to the, um, con connecting to the, the money exchange or something similar. And then they get NGOs involved. So these are all innovations that can be brought to a project like this that may not appear when you first look at it. And this, this is the power of PPP. You're harnessing different pre-existing or proven concepts, mixing them in a way that has a greater um, efficiency, and then um, taking it to market and trying to make it generate revenue. This, um, this is my friend Rocky. She runs an NGO for connecting with local fishing communities, providing them better education on how they take the fish out of the waters in order to ultimately um, sustain the fish populations. And it's on the basis of our work with that that I got the idea of how we would process a, 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 a this kind of PPP. Now, once the concept has been screened out, the project is ready to go into the Philippine PPP um, cycle. And the Philippines PPP cycle is law driven. It's, we understand exactly how it works. You, so you screen the project, you enter pre-feasibility, you go into feasibility, and then you tender the project if it's suitable. So very briefly, in pre-feasibility and feasibility, what you're looking for is slightly different. In pre-feasibility, you're answering the question of whether the project itself is suitable and desirable as a PPP. You do your needs analysis. You evaluate it by what the Philippines uses as a multi-criteria analysis, a checklist. Is this thing going to pass or not? And the good thing about pre-feasibility in Philippines is if this project doesn't is technically not going to work, financially not going to work, it's screened out pretty quickly. So you early decision gateways. And then in pre-feasibility, you set your initial design concepts. If that's approved, you move on to your um, feasibility study. And there the question is, is the project technically, legally, and financially viable? And a key element to financial viability is, can it return a reasonable rate of return to the investors. So with that, we now get to the contract phase. And there are two ways to view the contract phase in, in a PPP. The public sector perspective will require that 
the project has very clean output specifications. The government knows what it wants to get. It sets it out in a contract. It creates a standard by which to measure the project and then it has to determine internally what is the level of government support and financing provided. Is there any, is there some, or a lot? And then you wish to allocate the risk to the private sector. And Monday, Tuesday, or the first two days of this, we talked a lot about risk allocation, making it efficient. From the private sector perspective, the contract is going to, I mean, the, the investor needs to find the right consortium. With the right consortium, this very complex project becomes less complex because you have all of the right pieces in place. If you get the right consortium involved, they will have a very distinct advantage over other competitors because they can bring the project together at a lesser cost. From private sector wants to know how much support they're going to get from the government. And I remind you, some of the support it may be non-financial. And the private sector wants the contract to be flexible. They want the right to use innovation and try a mix of different ways to make money. And from my, my, my personal view is that the contract as long as the, the output specifications are very clear and the, and the opportunity um, for making money is legal, then there needs to be flexibility within the contract so that the uh, investors can have plan A, and if plan A starts to fall away, plan B, and still be able to meet their obligations. I mean, plan B is a different set of financial parameters. <clears throat> and then the um, ability to manage risk in the contract. And one way to do that is don't go and try to do a global contract on day one, but have a phased approach. So phase one targets one particular group. But set creates the backbone, the infrastructure backbone that can be phased or uh, you know, scoped up if you then you reach out from like Malaysia and then you go into Saudi Arabia or other, uh, Indonesia, for example. Okay, so with this, we now have a hypothetical PPP that uh, should be delivering innovation. So, thank you very much. I know this one was a little bit outside the box, but I thought if you want innovation in PPP, sometimes you have to be willing to go outside the, uh, outside the box. Thank you. <clears throat>